In the Buddhist tradition, unhappiness and suffering are said to be caused by craving, attachment, and desire. To eliminate suffering, one must eliminate egoistic desire. Naval Ravikant is a self-described rational Buddhist who offers keen philosophical insights. Insofar as Naval is also an astute entrepreneur and investor who has managed to amass a considerable fortune, he embodies a contradiction. Is Naval's pursuit of material wealth at odds with the Buddhist imperative to eliminate egoistic desire? How does he reconcile this contradiction? Before we get into that, who is Naval Ravikant? This video was inspired by a Twitter thread entitled, How to Get Rich Without Getting Lucky, which Naval wrote in 2018. The timeless tweets encapsulate Naval's philosophy on wealth creation, alluding to the key importance of finding meaning, creating impact, and putting in the necessary time and effort. This video was also inspired by Eric Jorgensen's must-read book, The Almanac of Naval Ravikant. Neither story nor narrative, Jorgensen's book is simply a compilation of Naval's best ideas from blog posts, interviews, tweets, and podcasts. By the end of this video, you'll not only be more familiar with the singular, public, and risky Naval brand, you'll have a better understanding of his unique philosophy on wealth and happiness. Naval was born in Delhi, India in 1974. I started out poor and miserable, uh, and I ended up with some money and ended up relatively happy. How did Naval make the transition from poor and miserable Indian non-entity to Silicon Valley power broker with an estimated net worth north of 60 million? Naval's family immigrated to the United States when he was nine, settling in Queens, New York. His parents split up soon after, and his father moved out, leaving his wife on her own to care for Naval and his brother Kamal. Because their mother worked long hours for meager pay, the boys had to make do with very little, and they became self-reliant at an early age. And because they lived in a rough part of town, Naval gravitated to the relative safety of the library where he spent countless hours staying until closing each day after school. His only real friends were books. Part of Naval's spectacular success is clearly attributable to the fact that he spent an inordinate amount of time buried in books during his formative years. Add to this the considerable advantage he gained by passing the admission test to Stuyvesant High School. And Naval was on track to attend an Ivy League college. I passed the test to get into Stuyvesant High School, right? And that was it. That saved my life. Okay. Because once I had the Stuyvesant brand, then I got into an Ivy League college. And once you're into Ivy League college, then I was in tech. You know, so yeah, that network mattered. But it, was, it started with no network. But there, Stuyvesant is like one of those intelligence lottery situations where mm -hmm. you can break into an instant validation uh, network, okay. right? So you, you go from being like blue collar to white collar in one move. At Dartmouth, Naval majored in economics and computer science. He toyed with the idea of pursuing a career in law, but after a brief and uninspiring stint as an intern at a stodgy white shoe firm, Naval abandoned his legal aspirations. He eventually made his way to Silicon Valley and found his calling in venture capital. Unfortunately, this pursuit was not without its share of trials and tribulations. And I've encountered plenty of bad luck along the way. The first little fortune that I made, I instantly lost in the stock market. The second little fortune that I made, or I should have made, I basically got cheated by my business partners. In 1999, Naval and four others collected $8 million in seed financing from Benchmark Capital and August Capital, and they co-founded a product review site called ePinions. All but one of the co-founders eventually moved on, leaving co-founder Nirav Tolia in charge. In early 2003, a proposal was made to merge Opinions with DealTime. Even though they owned enough common stock to scuttle the deal, the four absentee founders gave their consent, allowing their shares to be valued at zero because they were told the company was worthless. When the merged entity went public, rebranded as Shopping.com, Tolia and the venture backers cashed in. By the end of its first trading day, Shopping.com was valued at $750 million. Tolia's shares were worth around $38 million, and the VC firm's shares were worth $60 million. Naval describes the experience as horrific, 
saying it's like being hit by a truck when you realize the company you founded is going public and you've got nothing. Feeling cheated out of their rightful share of the IPO fortune, Naval joined two co-founders and a band of disgruntled ex-employees in suing Tolia and the VCs. They claimed the defendants conspired to defraud them by failing to share material facts concerning ePinion's financial affairs, including news of a deal with Google that would dramatically increase the company's profits. Because venture is a small world in which relationships are king and VCs are often friends, it's rare for founders to sue their financial backers. Not only did the decision to sue potentially jeopardize Naval's ability to secure funding for future projects, his reputation took a hit. .edu removed Naval's name from its list of partners, and his profile was taken off their website. Managing partner Asha Jadej played down the firm's relationship with Naval, saying they never had a formal arrangement and it was a good time to part ways. Journalist Brad Michael claimed many insiders considered the suit frivolous and were quick to side with August and Benchmark. An anonymous source went even further, saying Naval had better win the suit and make enough for life because he'd never work as a VC again. As a consequence of the suit, which ultimately settled out of court for an undisclosed sum, journalist Peter Delavet wrote that Naval's name was radioactive mud in much of Silicon Valley. So how did Naval go from being a dot-com pariah whose name was radioactive mud to a Silicon Valley power broker? With so many powerful forces arrayed against him, Naval could easily have given up on Silicon Valley and returned to New York. Instead, he persevered, turning a potentially ruinous experience into a net positive by becoming what's known in VC circles as an angel, someone who invests relatively small sums in promising startups that can't attract funding from larger VCs. To help aspiring entrepreneurs protect themselves from unscrupulous firms, Naval and his friend Babak Nevi began blogging about their experience on a site called Venture Hacks. They used the platform to riff on game theory, strategies for negotiating term sheets, and all things startup capital. In time, Naval and Nevi began sending out a weekly digest of pitches from promising startups to a select list of fellow angels. The service proved so popular, they turned it into a full-time business, which they called AngelList. Not only does their matchmaking service connect visionaries with investors, AngelList also assists with regulatory matters, such as confirming the bona fides of potential investors, handling some required filings, and supplying standard term sheets to reduce legal costs. From the darkness of the e-pinions ordeal, AngelList was born with the express purpose of disrupting the hegemony of the venture capitalists. For his role in educating novices about the ugly side of venture capital, and for his bold attempt to level the playing field between unsophisticated entrepreneurs and seasoned investors, Naval has been called an avenging angel. And to the extent that AngelList has become the calling card of every new startup, Naval has clearly given society something it wanted, but did not yet know how to get. Whether or not there's any truth to the avenging angel label, to the extent that Naval has clearly achieved great success in his chosen field, what shift in mindset yielded his phenomenal results? Naval came away from the e-pinions fiasco without developing the bitterness that ordinarily accompanies betrayal. Instead, he became profoundly philosophical, with a keen awareness of the duality of suffering. Contained within the pain of his suffering were the seeds of change and renewal, if not greatness. Probably the best thing that happened to me uh, I would say all the great things in life come from suffering, right? Because you, you're never going to do anything different than what you're doing now until you really suffer. Uh, one of my favorite philosophers has this great insight where he says, suffering is that moment when you see everything, when you see things the way they actually are. Mm. You can no longer deny it. You can no longer say, oh, no, she still loves me or he still loves me. You can no longer say, oh, I still have the money or I'm still going to win or I'm still going to be healthy. Suffering is when it all when you see reality the way that it truly is. And so when you see that, then you change. The key change that resulted from Naval's suffering was a renewed passion for the process of starting up and funding, which he parlayed into a wildly successful new business venture. Not only does he bear no grudges against those who cheated him out of his rightful share of the e-pinions IPO windfall, he feels gratitude to them for helping him become who he is, conceding, there would have been no angel list without that lawsuit. The Almanac opens with an intriguing premise. 
Making money is not a thing you do, it's a skill you learn. In his tweet storm, Naval distinguishes between wealth and money, saying we should seek wealth, which is having assets that earn while you sleep, instead of seeking money, which is how we transfer time and wealth. Naval is not saying you should forego cash. Everyone needs money to pay for the necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter. His point is merely that money is not the end game. Wealth is the end game, because wealth can generate money while you sleep. Wealth is the thing that you really want. Wealth is assets that earn while you sleep. Even a house can be a form of wealth because you can rent it out. So my definition of wealth is much more businesses and assets that can earn while you sleep. You want wealth because it buys freedom and the ability for you to be a sovereign individual. But really the reason you want wealth is because it buys you freedom. So you don't have to wear a tie like a collar around your neck. So you don't have to wake up at 7 a.m. and rush to work and sit in commute traffic. So you don't have to waste away your entire life grinding all the productive hours into a way into a soulless job that doesn't fulfill you. So the purpose of wealth is freedom. It's nothing more than that. It's not to buy fur coats or drive Ferraris or sail yachts or jet around the world in your Gulf Stream. That stuff gets really boring and really stupid really fast. It's really just so that you are your own sovereign individual. Anyone can become rich by exchanging their time for money, particularly high-salaried doctors and lawyers. But if you rent your time, you're not truly free because you have neither the flexibility to do the things you want when you want to do them, nor the freedom to avoid the things you don't want to do. I value freedom above everything else. Uh, and it's all kinds of freedom. Freedom to do what I want, freedom from not wanting to do what I don't want to do. Uh, sorry, freedom, yeah, and, and freedom from my own reactions and emotions and, and things that may disturb my peace. So for me, freedom is my number one uh, value. Renting out your time limits your earning potential in two key ways. Your hourly rate constitutes a hard cap on the amount you can charge for the value you bring, and there are a fixed number of hours in each day. Simply put, you're not going to get rich renting out your time. If your only source of income is a salary, you'll have to keep trading your time for money. If you want to be free, you'll need to accumulate wealth in the form of assets that can generate money while you sleep. Now that we understand the importance of building wealth to buy freedom, what are the key skills you can learn to build wealth and make money while you sleep? Naval sums them up in a handy mnemonic, productize yourself. Productize incorporates specific knowledge and leverage, and yourself incorporates accountability and uniqueness. Three of these concepts, specific knowledge, leverage, and accountability, figure prominently in his income formula. But what do they mean? To get a sense of the importance Naval places upon specific knowledge, his tweet storm mentions the concept eight times. Insofar as his definition of specific knowledge is knowing how to do something society cannot yet easily train other people to do, it describes an exclusive property that is unique to each individual. Specific knowledge represents the skills or abilities that individuals either possess innately or develop over time. Examples include musical talents, an aptitude for sales, networking abilities, an understanding of game theory, or an obsessive personality. Specific knowledge is often technical or creative and can't readily be automated. If society can easily train you to do something, your knowledge is not specific enough. Society can easily train someone else to replace you. To cultivate specific knowledge, Naval recommends pursuing your passion rather than following trends. Though Naval originally aspired to become a scientist, when he realized his true strengths lay in sales, analysis, and technology, he changed course and channeled his strengths into creating businesses. He derives great pleasure from deploying his specific knowledge in this way, knowing no one can compete with him on something that feels like play to him but looks like work to others. To me, creating businesses is play. I create businesses early stage because it's fun, because I, I, I'm into the product. Even when I invest, it's because I like the people, I like hanging out with them, I learn from them, and I think the product is really cool. I'm always working, but mm. it looks like work to them, but it feels like play to me. And that's how I know no one can compete with me on it because I'm just playing 16 hours a day. And if they want to compete with me and they're going to work, they're going to lose because they're not going to do it 16 hours a day, seven days a week. If you can't readily identify your specific aptitude, don't get discouraged. 
Naval cautions that it could take the better part of a decade to determine what you're uniquely able to provide. This is, it, it's hard. This is why I say it, it takes decades. Not necessarily because it just takes decades to execute, but the better part of a decade may just be, uh, just, may just be used figuring out what it is that you can uniquely provide. Naval says, no great fortune is built without leverage. Scary word, simple concept. Leverage simply means any tools that can multiply your efforts. The tools may be physical, such as machines and computers, or innate, such as creativity and well-honed skills. We are now living in an age of nearly infinite leverage, and all the great fortunes are created through leverage. Naval identifies three main types of business leverage capital, labor, and products with no marginal cost of replication. If you build a product with no marginal cost of replication, each new customer represents pure profit. Labor and capital are permissioned forms of leverage. To raise capital or to get people to work for you, you need their permission. Code and media are permissionless. You don't need anyone's permission to write books, record podcasts, or become a YouTuber. Wealth creation is basically a game of using leverage to sever inputs, the number of hours you work, from outputs, the amount you get paid. People seem to think that you can create wealth and make money through work, and it's probably not going to work. There are many reasons for that, but the most basic is just that your inputs are very closely tied to your outputs. In almost any salaried job, even a one that's paying a lot per hour, like a lawyer or a doctor, you're still putting in the hours and every hour you get paid. So what that means is when you're sleeping, you're not earning. When you're retired, you're not earning. When you're on vacation, you're not earning. And you can't earn nonlinearly. When you apply leverage, you get more of what you put in, creating a disconnect between your inputs and outputs. Tools and leverage are what create this disconnection between inputs and outputs. Creativity, so the higher the creativity component of a profession, the more likely it is to have disconnected inputs and outputs. So I think that if you're looking at professions where your inputs and your outputs are highly connected, it's going to be very, very, very hard to create wealth and make wealth for yourself in that process. In other words, leverage is a force multiplier that can enhance your earning potential, shifting your income from a linear track to one that's exponential. To achieve wealth, leverage is essential. But to access certain forms of leverage, such as capital or labor, you need credibility. And credibility can only be built by taking accountability under your own name. Accountability means having reputational skin in the game. When you put your name on something, you get to take credit for your successes, but you're also burdened with the risk of failure. People don't understand what accountability really entails. They think that accountability means being successfully accountable. No, it means that you have to stick your neck out and fail with your name out there publicly and be willing to let people hate on you. So embrace accountability. The rewards for putting your reputation on the line could include earning greater respect, gaining more responsibility, and potentially even receiving a share of the upside of a business in the form of equity.